Hi folks, I'm Jen Schleter, Dean of Graduate Studies here at Columbus College of Art and Design, a nonprofit art and design college that has been a creative force within Central Ohio for more than 140 years. And I wanna welcome you to tonight's event, which is part of CCAD's Visiting Artists and Scholars series. We are thrilled to host Chantel Martin tonight. Each semester, CCAD welcomes guest artists and scholars to teach workshops and seminars, engage in one-on-one -on -one mentoring and studio visits with graduate and undergraduate students, and lecture as part of the college's series. Before we jump into today's talk and I introduce our speaker, I just wanna share a couple of housekeeping notes. First, we're recording today's talk so that we can share it with those who weren't able to join us. Today's event is in webinar format, and so all lines are muted and videos are off other than for the speakers, but we will be able to answer your questions. So please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the discussion to submit them. You're also welcome to use the chat function to do the same. Um, and we also wanna make sure that we recognize some very special organizations. CCAD's Visiting Artists and Scholars series is made possible thanks to support from the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, and the Skestos Endowment Fund for Visiting Artists and Lectures. And now I'm excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Chantel Martin has managed to carve out a unique style and voice in the contemporary art world. Her mastery of the spontaneous drawn line has captivated an audience of international patrons, admirers, and collectors alike. Her art is exhibited and sought after by many top museums, galleries, and art spaces such as the Whitney Museum in New York City, the Oculus at the World Trade Center, Governor's Island, Denver Museum of Art, and a collaboration with the Pulitzer Prize winning musician Kendrick Lamar. She has worked with brands as varied as Google Creative Labs, Adidas, and Nike. Please join me in welcoming Chantel Martin. Hi there. Oh, hi there. I feel like I, I'll, I'll clap for myself there. And um, so it was funny, as I was waiting to speak, I was sitting here for a few minutes and doing nothing. And it's been a long time since I did nothing. And actually, it was really nice. So if you're watching this now, or if you're watching this in the future, take a few minutes for yourself and do nothing. So let's jump in here. I'm going to share my screen. So one second. Okay, here we go. So hopefully you can see my screen. And if you do, you see we're looking at Chantal Martin lines. And this is a philosophy. It's a journey. It's a path that I've been on. It's been a path of trying to understand a drawn line and where it's taken me and where I've come from. I was back in London in October 2021. And I got to see this artwork, this design that I did um, on a billboard or on a hoarding. So in England, this, um, this type of barrier is called a hoarding. And um, so long story short, this hoarding is in a place called Thamesmead in Southeast London. And that's where I grew up. So I grew up in Thamesmead in the early 80s. And for me, Thamesmead was, it was a really tough place to grow up. It's very working class, very racist, very homophobic. Um, lots and lots of lots of hurdles and barriers for myself growing up there. And in this picture, just where the cranes were, were actually miles and miles of flats, miles and miles of concrete flats. And I used to live in one of those flats. And so, I was honored when, you know, the Thamesmead Association reached out to me and said, Chantel, you know, we're knocking all of the flats down. We're knocking down your old apartment. We're knocking down all this history of where you're from. And we'd love to commission yourself and other local artists to create artwork that goes around the barrier. It goes around the hoarding. So I created this drawing. I sent it off to them and they put it up. And coincidentally, they didn't realize that they put this barrier up literally right below the exact flat that I used to live in. So just above my head in this picture, I actually used to live in an apartment right above there. And so for me, this was one of the most surreal experiences of my life as an artist, because when I was facing this drawing and looking up in the sky, I could see a little Chantelle looking out at me because I would often look out of the window at the road and see all the cars and the buses 
and everything go past. And I would wonder where everyone was going and I would wonder about my future. And then here I am, you know, 30 something years later, looking up at the sky where I used to look out at and where I used to live. And so that's an incredible thing about art. The incredible thing about art and drawing and creativity is it can take you on so many unique paths. And also I, I think this picture for me is really impactful because it actually illustrates trauma to triumph. You know, when I was a little Chantel looking out of that window, I didn't know my future. I didn't have control of my life. I didn't know that I would be doing what I do now. And so it's really interesting to be now on the other side of that. So one of my earlier characters, one of my first characters ever, since we're thinking about the past, was this character called H.M., Hangman. And Hangman was this almost like a robot character with a square head, a square body, a heart and a face. And this face wasn't smiling, it was quite the opposite. It was not smiling. And for me, Hangman represented myself when I used to draw this character. Like I said, this was the first character that I ever came up with and I would draw this and write Hangman everywhere. And Hangman symbolized for me, the future. It symbolized, you know, almost like this noose of being tied to a system, but Hangman broke free of that noose and had the heart and the potential to move forward and to achieve things that HM could never imagine for him or herself. And so now, you know, I'm gonna show you one of my more recent projects. So I've just came back from Boston where I choreographed my first ever ballet. So, you know, when I think about that, that's crazy. You know, this little girl from Southeast London growing up in these giant concrete flats. And then many years later, I'm in Boston having a world premiere of my first ballet that I've choreographed at the Boston Opera House commissioned by the Boston Ballet. And so I created a ballet called Kites. And for me, kites metaphorically or physically represents this idea of positivity, of lightness, this idea of the struggle or the companionship of gravity and thrust and pull and all of those physics that go in to getting a kite off and in the air. And for me, you know, this project was really incredible because as an artist, someone that isn't a dancer, someone that isn't a choreographer. I got invited to choreograph a ballet, which for me seemed like a crazy idea. It seemed like a scary idea. Why would I want to do something that is totally outside of my comfort zone? And I wanted to do it because I love to be challenged. I love to show people that if you bring your true self, your identity, your fingerprint, your knowledge, your experience, you can translate that to any industry in any medium you like. And so Kites was a piece with 11 dancers and I worked uh, in collaboration with the Boston Ballet on the costume and I did the set design and they had an incredible lighting designer. And so it was so nice to sit back and watch the ballet come together on the opening night. And I think that's one of the first times I've ever sat in the audience and have seen my work come together on stage. And so it's something I challenge everyone to, you know, to really look at what makes you, you, you know, what is your identity? What is your fingerprint? If you were to go out of your comfort zone and into a different industry and into a different medium, what does that look like? And I think if you're doing it in a way with good intention, you're doing it in a way where you are authentically being yourself. It will look like you, it will sound like you, it will feel like you. And that's a theme within my work. You know, a theme in my work is about transparency. It's about showing the process. 
you know, I'm not even hiding anything here as I, as I present today, because I want everyone to see kind of how things are made and how they're created and share in that. And I think that comes from this journey that I've been on for many, many years of asking this simple question, who are you? Who are you? And this is a question that I ask or have asked for many, many, many years in my work. And I even give people stickers. I give people stickers that say, who are you? Or are you you? And for me, this question is kind of magical because, okay, let me, let me actually ask you the question. If I were to ask you, who are you? And you were to answer without saying what you do, where you're from, or the roles that you play in your life, how would you answer? If I were to ask you the question, who are you? And you were to answer, without saying what you do or the roles that you play in your life or where you're from, how would you answer? And I've noticed that we can say where we're from. We can say what we do. We can say the roles that we play in our lives, daughter, son, doctor, student, teacher, etc. But we don't really have the vocabulary to describe who we are at the core. And if you can know this, the first three letters of who are you W, A, Y. So I've been trying to find my way as an artist through this language of words and lines and drawings. And, you know, actually this picture is from the, the Lincoln Center when I got to work with another ballet, coincidentally in 2019, I took over the promenade of the New York City Ballet and I created an installation there by initially watching rehearsals. So I would go to rehearsals and have this whole theater by myself. And I would watch the choreography and create lines and create movements inspired by it. And that became one of the main works in this installation at the Lincoln Center, where behind me here is a picture from the New York Times. And you can see just a fraction of these choreography drawings that ended up filling up this beautiful space at the promenade. When I'm creating work, I want you to feel like you're immersed in the work. I want you to feel like you're in my world, you're in my head. And I also want you to see that the work I'm creating is something that we can all do. All of my work starts initially with a line. You know, I'm drawing on canvas or uh, I'm drawing on my iPad and that becomes this big floor mural, or I'm drawing in Illustrator and then I'm having that Illustrator file extruded and turned into these seats here on the bottom. And so everything I'm doing comes from a line. It comes from a pen. It comes from something that we all have access to. And here's a picture of the Oculus in World Trade Center where I took over 21 screens and I took over those screens with these questions of who are you, you are you, and you are you. And it's so nice to, in a way, I see these words like a seed and planting seeds. So perhaps some of these people see this question, perhaps some of these people pay attention to it, perhaps some of these people ponder on that question, perhaps no one sees it, but in a way it's out there. And because it's out there, it's almost like a seed that's been planted out into the world. And in a way, that's what we're doing as artists. That's what we're doing as creative people. We are putting seeds out there. We are putting um, messages out there that carry the themes that we carry as creative people. And it's, it's interesting, you know, seeing these seeds, these messages, take different forms. So um, I think it was, I'm just thinking out loud, in 2018, I work with the Whitney Museum and with the Whitney Museum shop, we did a complete takeover. So if anyone's been to the Whitney Museum and like most museums on the first level or kind of near the entrance, you'll find a shop. And for me, there's something special about museum shops. 
And there's something special about product. You know, the art world is this big fancy world where there's all this hierarchy about what you should do or what you shouldn't do as an artist. There's this hierarchy about what you should do to add value to your work and what you should do to avoid devaluing your work. And product is one of those interesting things where I think traditionally people have said, hey, if you put your work on product, it can devalue your work. Well, I have to disagree with that. You know, as someone that didn't grow up going to museums, I think that our bodies are museums, our fridges are museums when we put postcards on there and magnets. You know, our feet are museums when we put really cool sneakers and shoes on them. And so for me, product is really important. So I was one of the first ever artists, and, and I don't think they've done this since, but to go into um, the Whitney Museum shop and work with them to produce new product and find existing product of mine that already existed and take over the shop. And for me, this is super special because the thing with products is that you're creating something now that people can gift, that people can collect, that people can buy for themselves. And in this installation or in this takeover, there was products as affordable as $7 all the way up to multiple thousands of dollars. And, you know, I think the nice thing about this is, you know, with product, it's a really easy way to carry an important message. So in this picture, you can see that there's posters that say a kindness is a better way forward. And then there's sticker packs that say you are you and in there there's some other stickers and also some key tags. So I'm a big believer in product because it's also a way that really gets to push yourself. And so with the Whitney Museum shop takeover was actually one of the first times I got to work with Neon. So this is one of a series of, I believe five Neon pieces that all were in different colors and represented different themes. So this is yellow and with the word be, be yourself know yourself, get to explore yourself and be reminded in, in this way. This is also that poster, but in, in a neon form where it says kindness is a better way forward. And so with art, with illustration, with creativity, it can also be a way to improve life, to help us to question things, to help us to explore things to help us to explore ourselves, to help us to interact with the world. This is an installation that was created for the Denver Art Museum for my show there called Words and Lines. And probably like many of you, I'm a very large and proud uh, dyslexic. <laughs> I've been totally dyslexic all my life. I don't think it's going away. Um, sometimes it gets a little bit better, but other times I just see it as my superpower. And so I've always had this really interesting relationship with words because I didn't know I was dyslexic until I went to art school, until I went to Central St. Martin's in my first week, everyone was like, Chantelle, you're dyslexic. And I was like, I'm not one of those people. And um, sure enough, I went for a test and they said I was dyslexic. dyslexic. And, you know, it was possibly one of the best things that have ever happened to me. You know, I think knowing that you have an interest in or an alternative relationship to words is a superpower. Knowing that you think differently and are able to think more creatively or creatively in a different way is a superpower. So this was a piece at the Denver Museum that reflects this idea of lines and words and the fact that words are lines. You know, words are made up of lines. It's just that we give them much more importance. So this piece itself, you could turn it around and make combinations of phrases. You could turn it around and make drawings. You could turn it around and make gibberish, just kind of like what this is, or you could turn it around and discover 
that there's hidden geometry inside some of the works. So that's a really uh, interesting relationship with words and lines. So another thing that happened, I think also around 2018, 19, that's probably not true, maybe even 2020, I'm not best with, with dates, but I had my first ever museum retrospective um, at the New Britain Museum of American Art, which is in Connecticut. And it's a beautiful museum. And it's actually one of the oldest museums in the country. And so I was honored to have a retrospective there that actually really celebrated my career exploring different mediums. So there are a couple of different rooms, but in this room, you can see, you know, I don't know how detailed you can see here, but the stripy wall, that is an installation or a series that I did with my grandmother. So I collaborated with my grandmother, Dot Martin, for many, many years. And I would send her instructions. Dear grandmother, please sew me lucky in life, any color, any size. And she would sew it and then send it back to me. And then she would say, what's next? And so we did that almost over 15 or 20 years. And we created over 70 to 80 pieces. And it formed a series of work called Dear Grandmother. And since then, we've, I've shown it or we've shown it in the Brooklyn Museum and then here in the New Britain Museum of American Art. And for me, this collaboration has been very special in the sense that my grandmother never saw herself as an artist. You know, my grandmother didn't go to school. She didn't see herself as creative, but she had a craft. And just like many of our grandparents or that generation, they have such a skill with their hands. They have a skill or skills that are tangible. And so I think it's super important um, and vital to collaborate with older generations and learn those skills and learn those crafts. Because, you know, when we are grandchildren, when our grandchildren are at our age, what am I trying to say? When we're grandparents, we can tell our grandkids that we, we did this, you know, and in the future, no one's probably typing. And so therefore we don't really have crafts that we can pass forward in the future. So I, encourage you all to collaborate with your grandparents or with uh, older generational people if they're out there. Cross-generational projects are super fun. I've also, I love to see my lines on different materials, on different textiles. And here you can see a couch. This is a Togo, a very famous shaped couch by Linga Rosse. And I've covered it in my textiles. So I have a textile line out there's four designs, 40 different colors, and it's actually collected by the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian, in their contemporary textile collection. And so it's really fun to see lines come out of the paper, out of the canvas, and be something that you can actually sit on and enjoy and be a part of. Or it's nice to see when lines become almost like camouflage, where they take over a space and they take over almost yourself. And so this is a picture from a solo show that I had at the Albright Knox. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when I look back at my career, I've had multiple museum solo shows, but not as many gallery solo shows because I think the gallery world is such a different beast. You know, the gallery world is, is something that um, I've managed to, not intentionally, but we've on my career path, in my career path, I've gone from being, you know, an independent artist to an independent artist where I am today. But this is a picture from the Albright Knox where I created, um, you know, this, this large table with over a couple of hundred found objects and toys that I cleaned and gessoed and drew on. And you know, a nice kind of um, story about this is that when I went to see the space before I went to draw on it, the show before mine was a Picasso show. So when I walked into the gallery, they were taking down the Picassos and wheeling them out. And so it was such a surreal experience to see Picassos that I'd seen in school books as a kid 
being wheeled out on a trolley and then knowing that I next were going to draw on these walls. So it's, it's magical and bizarre where art can take you. And so here's a picture here of the sculpture court for this area where I had that show. And for me, it's also important to explore and share the process. So I don't believe in just turning up to a museum or a space and drawing and leaving, or even drawing behind closed doors. For me, it's important to share the process. So when I created this show, there were times where I invited the public and I invited guests to come and see me draw. And why I think that's important is that sometimes artists believe if you share the process, then you lose the magic. Or if you share the process, someone else might copy you or imitate you. I believe if you share the process, you actually get to create real connections and real experiences. For me, the whole point of creating art is to make and to share, to make and to share. And therefore, the most important part of the art is the actual sharing of the making of the work. And when you see an artist create the work, you become a part of it. You become a part of that experience. You become a part of that history and that life of the work. For me, it doesn't make sense to hide away in a studio, make the work, and then suddenly it appears in a museum or a gallery in a frame. I think in those instances, you create a distance. Not to say that that's wrong, but just to say that I encourage people and yourselves to share the process and bring people into the work. And so I often create works in a public space in event settings, in places where people can walk through them and explore them. And this is a piece that I did at the Hammersmith Ballroom in New York. And so the black and white textile or the black and white drawing you see is actually printed on textiles and the yellow or the green, depending on how you see this, lines I drew live. So the guests came in and then I drew live as they were there. I've also done shows with, for example, um, in the intro, you heard that I've worked with artist Kendrick Lamar before. And so with Kendrick, I drew, um, you know, I created these drawings and then they became the visuals in this 360 degree projection zone this 360 degree projection dome. And so if you imagine these lines moving and moving and then this room filling up with people dancing, seeing the stage, but then looking up and seeing all the drawing above them. There's something really magical about drawing. You know, often people say, well, Chantal, when you're drawing, what happens if you make a mistake? What happens if you go wrong? And I say, it's all one big mistake but I've just learned to enjoy the process. When I'm drawing, drawing is a focus. It keeps me calm, it keeps me directed. It keeps me, um, it keeps me in line. And, um, you know, something like this or any of my drawings, what's also nice is that I don't know what the final drawing will look like. For me, it's always a surprise because I'm so focused in looking right in front of my face, right in front of the pen, trying to make that line as solid, as crisp, as sharp as possible, making sure that line doesn't slip or go anywhere that that line doesn't want to go. And so there's something nice about trusting the work and trusting that it will tell you where to go instead of you telling the line where to go. I, a few years ago, I tried some light drawing with a friend, a friend John, who lives in Denver, is an incredible photographer, and he encouraged me to go out and practice drawing with light. And so this has been a really interesting series of works where you don't know what you're drawing because you can't see it. And you have to trust 
that you know where the line is and that you know where the light is. So for a picture like this, you know, I'm drawing in the air, imagining where the eye would be, imagining where the nose would start, imagining where the next eye would be and creating a picture in my mind that the camera captures over time. And it's such a nice process to, to capture. And so coming back to this idea of just exploring different mediums, this is one of those pieces that my grandmother created and it says, come home. So I asked her in one of the letters that I wrote to her, dear grandmother, please sew me, go home, any color, any size. And so she sewed me the words, go home, any color, any size. And then she also sewed me this piece that said, come home. But the reason I asked her to sew, go home, is that we would have these conversations about race. We would have these conversations about being from different generations. We would have conversations that just spoke about life but we use the artwork as the springboard or as the driving force into those conversations. You know, I am a, a biracial child talking to my white English grandmother and we are both born and grown up in England, but have had very different unique lives. And I think before this collaboration, we would just speak about the weather. You know, we would, we would talk kind of regularly, but we would just ask each other how the weather was. And so this was a really nice way to explore, talking about things that are a little bit deeper, talking about things that perhaps we wouldn't have done otherwise, talking about things that allowed us to really get to know each other. And on the theme of my grandmother, she taught me how to play cards. We would play Jim Rummy and she would win all of my money. <laughs> but as a part of that kind of memory or homage to my grandmother, one of the products that I made with the Whitney Museum shop was a pack of these playing cards by a company called Theory 11, who make these incredible cards. And so with the Whitney Museum shop, created these cards in black and white and white and black so that I could play cards and think about my grandmother within all of my money there. Coming back to, you know, where your work can take you, you know, this is the, the question of who are you on all the screens of Times Square. This is, you know, right after speaking at Adobe Max with some other incredible artists that you might recognize. Um, this is, you know, working with an incredible model and, and uh, someone that encourages women and coding and, um, you know, having the opportunity to collaborate and speak with talented people out there in the world. Uh, taking this idea of a line and seeing where it can take you. I love working with products, as I mentioned earlier. You know, product is something that we can wear. We become the galleries, we become the museums. This is a project I did, I think in 2020, where I worked with Adidas or Adidas and the Maker Lab. And so we did kind of custom uh, different types of shoes and t-shirts. And so that you got to really choose what you wanted and, and how you would feel about it. Some of the projects that I get to work on take me into unusual places and territories. And so here is a metal worker, a metal smith. It, um, I apologize if I got the kind of the job description wrong, but highly talented, incredible metal smith worker that works with the, you know, the royal family and, and you know, a lot of that fancy stuff in England. Um, this is a trophy designed for the Golden Vines Award, which is a very fancy but amazing charity in the UK that helps to bring diversity into the wine industry. And so I worked with them last year to design this trophy 
that was given to their awardees um, in, in that sector. And so it's, you know, it's so fun to work with craftsmen and craftswomen from complete different areas and skill sets that, that I have than myself. I don't like heights, but often I find myself up ladders and up lifts. Often I find myself not looking down. Often I find myself trying to be brave and look down. But I feel like art, if it isn't challenging you, if it isn't bringing you to places where you feel uncomfortable, if it isn't pushing you to overcome your fears, then you're not perhaps in the right place. Art for me has been something that has allowed me to challenge myself. It's allowed me to grow. It's allowed me to connect. It's allowed me to pursue bringing my work into places where I never would imagine seeing them before. It's allowed me to create installations that bring positive messages into the world. This is an installation called the May Room and it's on Governor's Island in New York. And so the May Room was a space that I created because I personally feel like I'm searching for peace. I'm searching for quiet places. I'm searching for places where I can unplug. I'm searching for places where I can think clearly, but still be inspired. So the May Room is a space where you walk in, you take your shoes off, and you walk around this maze. As you walk around this maze, you get to calibrate or recalibrate yourself and become calm. And then in the May Room, as you become calm, you get to see that all these little dots on the wall are actually little phrases that start with May. May you be kind. May we save trees. May you sleep soundly at night. May you, may you, may we. And there's over a hundred may wishes, well wishes that feel like they're falling into you or rising from you. And this is a space where there is no power. There's only natural light and a space where I collaborated with the American Society of Poetry to bring the voice into the space, to really activate the space, to really create a space where people could come in and feel inspired and feel calm and feel at peace and have that opportunity to contemplate with themselves. We spoke a lot about drawing. Drawing is, as I said, it keeps me focused. Drawing is a career for me. Drawing is this life that I've chosen for myself. But the thing that actually makes me happy is playing music. I love playing music and I say music, I use the term music very lightly. Maybe I should say I like playing sounds and I like playing a keyboard just like a drawing. So here I sat down at a piano and I'm playing music at the 92nd Street Y. I'm doing a performance with Joanna, an incredible dancer here, but the drawing is with the keys of the piano. And just like a drawing, I approach playing music in the same way. I approach it confidently, without hesitation and with repetition. That's how I draw and that's how I play music. And as I'm doing that, I also start to see the words. Words come to me as I'm playing the music confidently, without hesitation, with repetition. And then I start to see the words and those words come from myself. And so I recently put up all of my music on SoundCloud. So if any of you are curious, it's out there. But like I said, it's something that just really makes me happy and keeps a nice balance. Lastly, here in my little slide lineup, one of my most recent collaborations is with the North Face. So I work with the North Face across Europe and we released a whole series of 
apparel from fleeces to jackets to hoodies to t-shirts and this is incredible to work with a brand that as a 19 year old you know I saved up for my first North Face bag and and so it's interesting to then many years later work with brands that you've enjoyed and admired and you know later on so I have all of everything I've spoken about on my website, which, you know, is, is super playful. It's super fun. Um, this is a, a website that was now designed in 2016. So as websites go, this website is quite old, but I like to document all the work that I create. I like to keep it updated. I like to have a place to look back and to reflect on. I think it's important as artists to document your work, to have somewhere where you can reflect back on, to have a place where you can see what you've done. I think many of us that are very hard on ourselves, we're always moving forward, moving forward, moving forward, but very often, sorry if you saw that, but very often we don't have the time to, to really look back and reflect on and reflect on what we've achieved as artists. So with that, you know, I remind you to ask yourself, who are you? I ask yourself, how are you finding your way in life? I'm finding my way in life through this language of words, and lines and drawings. And I love the fact that who are you the first three letters of that are way, and the answer to it of you are you, the first three letters are yay. So in a way, essentially, we're all trying to find our way to yay. Yay is that place, a celebration of self, a celebration of knowing, a celebration of growing, a celebration of knowing that you don't know anything and that you have to start all over again. So on that note, I thank you so much for taking the time to listen and to hear me speak on some of my past projects and some of my future hopes. And uh, I'm looking forward to taking some questions. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanna say, yay, that was uh, fantastic and so inspiring. Um, yes, folks, you can go ahead and feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A. And meanwhile, I wanna start with this one that came into me earlier. So um, can you, you ended talking about your uh, collaboration with North Face and collaboration is sort of stretched across your career. Can you talk a little bit about how you decide who you wanna partner with? That's a good question. So firstly, you know, how do I find these collaborations? They mostly 99.9% .9 those collaborations come to me and then I say yes or no. But then how do I say yes or no? I have almost a checkbox and I think I should make a poster of this at some point. So if someone asks me to collaborate and they're not a friend and they're someone that I don't know, I will ask myself, ethically and morally, does this align with where I'm coming from? Is this something that challenges myself? Is this something that allows me to do something that I cannot do by myself? Is this something that will expose my work to a different demographic? Is this something that gets to amplify this message of freedom of creativity, of accessibility, etc.? that I have? And then lastly, is this a project that values me as an individual and an artist? And that value is in the form of a fair exchange. And that exchange doesn't always have to be monetary, but it has to show that there is a fair exchange of services and of time um, and of value. That's fantastic. Yes, you should make a poster of that <laughs> um, because you know we have a lot of students um, in this space with us right now, and um, I think for them trying to figure out like who you sort of partner with and why has got to be top of mind. Yeah. So yeah, that's really really insightful. Um, and speaking of students, can you can you talk a little bit about what kind of suggestions you might have for students? who want to work at the like, scale that you work at, how do you get to that um, capacity? 
Yeah. And so firstly, just to expand on the, the first question is also that, you know, the work does come to me. I've tried to seek out work in the past and you'll email an institution or a brand and you say, hey, I'm an artist, I'd love to work with you. And they don't know who you are, so they don't care who you are. And for me, it's not worked that way. They've had to have seen my work and come to me directly because then they want to work with you and half of the work is done in that regard. With the question of how do you get to the scale of the types of projects that I'm working on, the answer is just one foot in front of the other. You know, you put one foot in front of the other and you grow over time and it's very grassroots like that. I can't just go in and suddenly take over the New York City Ballet or I can't go in and take over every screen in Times Square or the Oculus because it doesn't make sense. And yes, you know, I think some people's career, perhaps they do that, you know, and they will jump right over here. But for myself, it's been really nice just starting small, starting with my friend's space, starting to be invited into other spaces, starting to grow my confidence, starting to learn what tools are available to me. And then over time, putting one foot in front of the other, growing to a scale that is something that I could not even imagine a few years ago. Perfect. Um, so uh, one of our instructors has just dropped a question in and said that um, in preparation for your visit, um, his class um, looked at the, your website as the focus of their creative coding course, which is fantastic. Wow. Um, and they're wondering um, how much influence did you have on the design of the website? And did you collaborate with the developers in creating the interactive elements? So the website was designed by Anton and Irene, and they are a duo, they're incredible uh, designers. And essentially I went to them and said, I'm an artist, I should have an incredible website that reflects that I'm a visual person and reflects that all the types of different things that I do. And actually I, I should have a look and, and see if I can share a link, but if you Google Anton and Yvonne, I-R-E-N-E, -E, and my name slash website, they actually on their homepage have a really nice description of how they came up with the design for my website and kind of all of the, the um, you know, thinking that they did to build out also my, um, you know, my typeface, my logo type. So to answer that question, I didn't have really any input apart from make me a cool website. And then they were like, great, you need to show up here so we can photograph you. And then you need to draw this so that we can do this to it. And then you need to provide this work so that we can put it there. And so it's actually quite hands off on, on my side of things. But like I said, their website, they actually have almost like a case study of, um, of working on that site, which like I said, now is 2016. So it's actually quite ancient for a website. That's fantastic. And it looks like John dropped the link um, into the chat there. So Anton and Irene are down there for folks who want to follow along. Um, well, then let's talk about um, embodiment a little bit, because um, sometimes when you draw, you draw publicly. We get to watch you do it physically, and you're choreographing now. And so can you talk a little bit about the role of the, like, the body in your work? Yeah, you know, I think for many years I've seen myself as a dancer, you know, and I, I think I've never really said that openly. It's almost been a joke to myself. Because even from, and I didn't really speak about this today, but I started my career in Japan. I lived in Japan for five years and my job was a VJ, a visual jockey. So I would create live drawn digital visuals to dancers, DJs and musicians. And so the dancers would be dancing, for example, and I would be drawing and that drawing would be projected on them or behind them. And so I would be dancing with my pen, trying to keep up with them. And then I would say, oh, I'm a dancer. Aside from that, you know, I am coming in often and drawing a 50 foot wall, a 100 foot wall, a 200 foot wall, but I'm doing it in, I'm doing it in one day or two days. Whereas 
typically other artists will take a week or two weeks or three weeks. I say, come on, let's go. And when I'm drawing so physically on these large walls, I have to be as super efficient with all of my moves so that A, I'm moving efficiently and effectively so that I can create the most amount of line with the least amount of movement. And so also just the way that I move in my body to draw is that it's very physical, but that physicality is done in a way where it's super efficient. So if I'm drawing a line there and then it comes back, I will move my body in a way where I, can, I don't have to move it as much as I would if I was really considering what I'm doing, because now it's more of a flow. Um, so it's, you know, it's almost like Tai Chi in a way where you're just uh, flowing with the pen in your hand. Is that related for you to when you talk about um, like using meditative intuition in your practice? Yeah, drawing is a meditation. You know, when you're drawing, as I mentioned a few times, you have to be super focused and aware of what you're doing. But you also, I'm sorry, you also have to take uh, a back seat. You know, so when I'm drawing, I take a back seat to what I'm doing. And so it is like meditation because you're aware and focused, but you're taking a back seat to that. Makes so much sense. All right, one questioner is asking, who are your biggest inspirations like right now? Yeah, you know, I've always struggled with this question. You know, I think firstly, because I don't really remember names so well. Um, but secondly, because I think it's often important to go in before you go out. And so, you know, my, my cheap way of answering that question is like the people around me that I get to see grow, the people and artists around me, where I've seen them work and they're tangible because I know them. Uh, it's hard for me to be inspired by something I don't know and that I've not seen the growth. But I'm also inspired by this idea of trying to be a better version of yourself. And we have a wealth of inspiration within us that can inspire us to go out into the world. And so, you know, um, I'm inspired by music and dancing and all sorts of things but i can't give you names because my brain doesn't retain that stuff but uh, you know i'm inspired by living <laughs> that's totally fair and it makes so much sense i think it's great advice also for students to think about going in and not always looking out uh for, for the, what it can inspire you um and that reminds me that you've done a fair amount of teaching and you talked a little bit in this um conversation today about um, finding your identity or finding your fingerprint um, as an artist. Um, and I'm wondering um, what kinds of um, lessons come up again and again in your classrooms? Yeah, for me personally, the lesson is that when you teach, you walk into a room and you tell students to do all the things that you know you should be doing for yourself. <laughs> so it's a nice reminder from my perspective of what I should be doing. But from the student's perspective, I think what comes up a lot is confidence. And I think often with students that I've been teaching over the years is that we are our own biggest hurdle. You know, we stop ourselves. We um, become insecure. We become, you know, um, we, we give ourselves blockages sometimes because we're worried about what might happen or what people might think of us when we create, especially when we're creating live. And so often in my classes, I try and initially put my students in positions where we take time out of the equation. You know, so we're drawing fast, we're drawing with blindfolds, you know, we're, we're, we're drawing in the air, you know, we're doing things that get you out of your comfort zone so you don't have to worry or be too precious over the final product. And I think once we get over that initial hurdle, um, we become and, and start to build confidence. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And it's a really good reminder that when we're teaching, we're also trying to sort of solve our own stuff, you know, along the way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. And this is a great place to sort of bring this conversation to a pause. Um, 
Thank you for being here with us tonight, Chantel, and thank you uh, to the folks who are listening with us tonight. Before we go, I just want to share a couple of announcements. Um, if you want to learn more about some CCAD events, you can always check out our website. I'm also putting a link to a survey here in the chat. Um, we um, want to collect feedback on folks who join us for events like this for our grantors and funders. Um, so you'll see some um, questions regarding uh, things like uh, demographics, and that's what that's for. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you, Chantel. What a pleasure and an honor to have you. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this immensely and hope to be there in real life at some point. Absolutely. We got to figure it out. Have a great evening, everybody. See you later. Bye. Good night. <laughs>